Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I want to talk about today is we have Conor McGregor in the news for not great reasons. Like, news came out, Conor McGregor's at the Barclays Center after media day. Okay, that's exciting. Conor McGregor knows how to put on a show. He's probably angry at the UFC for stripping him of his lightweight championship belt. You know, maybe he's gonna show up, have a war of words, get people hyped about him coming back. Well, the video that was captured of him there is crazy. He picks up a guardrail, he attempts to throw that, he then tries to throw something else. At one point, and it's unclear who exactly does it, if it was Conor McGregor or someone else, someone throws something and it slams into the front of the bus. That bus reportedly filled with UFC fighters. According to reporters on the scene, McGregor and his entourage swarmed that bus. There's also video from inside and outside the bus of Conor throwing a dolly into the bus. And in the midst of all of this, one of the fighters suffered a laceration across his forehead. And as far as what happens next, when Dana White was talking to media, he, he wasn't even talking about the, the, the scheduling of fights. He had this to say. There was a warrant out for Conor McGregor's arrest, and um, uh, they're looking for him right now. His plane cannot take off. He cannot leave the state of New York uh, with this warrant. They, they're, they're, he'll be grounded, and uh, I'm assuming eventually, if they don't catch him, he'll turn himself in. Uh, you can imagine, He's gonna be sued beyond belief, and uh, this was a real bad career move for him. But despite Dana White saying that, a reporter by the name of Mark Raimondi, he tweeted, just spoke to a spokesman for the NYPD. There is no warrant out for Conor McGregor's arrest at this time, he said. They are, though, looking for him and want to speak with him, the spokesman said. No one has filed charges against McGregor at this moment. There are also people on social media saying Conor McGregor most likely did this because of something Khabib did the other day, specifically the interaction between Khabib and another fighter and friend of Conor McGregor. But kind of on that note, Dana White said, Listen, you don't like Khabib and you don't like what happened or whatever, then fight Khabib. You can come in here and you can do it legally. Shit, this fight's happening Saturday. We could have talked and made the Khabib fight right after. You could do whatever you wanted to Khabib within the limits of the rules of, of, of you know, fighting. But you want to grab 30 fucking friends and come down here and, uh, and do what you did today? It's disgusting. And that's where we are right now. Obviously, we'll, we'll stay on top of the situation, see what happens. Wow, I don't, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, I am, I'm personally a fan of Conor McGregor. This is just pure insanity, especially for a guy that is in such a fantastic position in his career. Then let's talk about the really not so surprising update we got around the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook scandal. The original estimate came from whistleblower Christopher Wiley, who said that 50 million people, their data was used by Cambridge Analytica. But yesterday, Mark Zuckerberg told reporters on a conference call that 87 million users data may have been shared with Cambridge Analytica. And it seems like the reason that we're seeing this shift in numbers is primarily the, the estimate, the estimated number of people that granted the app permission that was at the center of this situation, that survey. It was previously 270,000 people, but now it's being reported that it was 305,000 people. And so those are the numbers we're getting now from Facebook after they did their own internal review. However, Cambridge Analytica is giving the public a different story. Tweeting out, Cambridge Analytica licensed data from GSR for 30 million individuals, not 87 million. We did not receive more than 30 million records from research company GSR. And so essentially they're trying to distance themselves from the number, the narrative seeming that GSR may have gotten 87 million, but we only got 30. But all of that said, I haven't even gotten to the best part. It came out that one of the main sources of vulnerability for Facebook was its search option. It allows you to look up anyone if you have their email, their phone number. Whether you show up or not is supposed to be an opt-in feature, but in the security settings, it was set on by default. And so in a blog post from Facebook CTO Mike Schrofer, in regards to this, he said, malicious actors have also abused these features to scrape public profile information by submitting phone numbers or email addresses they already have through search and account recovery. Given the scale and sophistication of the activity we've seen, we believe most people on Facebook could have had their public profiles scraped in this way. So we have now disabled this feature. And then during that conference call that I mentioned with Mark Zuckerberg, he said, I would assume if you had that setting turned on that someone at some point has access to your public information in some way. So that's great. Now to be fair to Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, he has very much now owned the mistake. Also seemingly being realistic about Facebook while they're, they're making changes now, he's saying that it's going to take years to properly fix things. And also, and I get a lot of us are just like beating on Facebook right now, but it's moments like these that we also need to remember other situations. Like remember when Equifax in what has now come out as a pretty preventable hack lost 147 million Americans' personal information, including a bunch of social security numbers? Right, like a situation that has led to God knows how much fraud, and they're still seemingly thriving as a company. And then we, we look to Facebook, which that is still a problem. But having seen, and obviously the situation can change, the reactions we've, we've seen from the government in both situations, it almost feels like they're gonna go after Facebook more. And I'm not trying to make a whataboutism, right? I think that both situations need to be handled properly, but it, it is interesting. It's just something 
thing I wanted to share that's been bugging me. Not sure if it adds to the story, but I, in general, I'd love to know your thoughts on this one. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome, brought to you by the Boycott Everyone shirt and hoodie and all our awesome stuff over at shopdefranco.com with bestsellers like Don't Be Stupid Stupid, Why Be Informed When You Can Use Your Feelings As Your Facts, also one of my favorite new ones, the Stay Humble Hustle Hard, and also best-selling classics like the Sports and Pretentious Shirts. And so if you want to snag one of those while you can, go to shopdefranco.com or just click the link in the description down below. And the first bit of awesome is today I was on an episode of Hot Ones. If you watch my show, you're probably familiar with that show because it's one of my favorite interview shows. And so we shot an episode together, of course, because it's Sean Evans, it was awesome, but then I also did something to try and make it a little most special. So if you have time after today's video, I highly recommend you watch it. Then we have the Honest Games trailer for Sea of Thieves. We had Life Noggin asking, how can we make the perfect city? We also got a new clip and trailer for Incredibles 2. We also had Seeker put out this really interesting video about these robots that, that just go across toxic sea floors. They bring back new weird species. We also got this amazing Red Band trailer from Blumhouse Productions. It's so this movie called Upgrade, and obviously I'm excited for the story, but in the trailer, there are, there are so many moments where I'm like, oh, the camera work. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links, as always, are in the description down below. Then, let's talk about The Guardian, who appears to pride themselves on good, solid, independent journalism, taking a shot at Felix PewDiePie. Of course, Felix, one of the largest creators on the platform, has been for a very, very long time. He has had his scandals, but for the most part, a lot of that has gone by. Well, today, The Guardian put out an article titled, What's Up, PewDiePie? The Troubling Content of YouTube's Biggest Star. Childish, offensive, and immensely popular, the YouTube star whose real name is Felix Shelberg continues to command a huge audience, but what is he really saying? I love that because the only thing it's missing from, from corny local television is find out tonight at 10. Could your child watching PewDiePie give them cancer? Find out tonight. Also fun note, the, the, the little line underneath the main headline that initially read childish, bigoted, and immensely popular. But then they decide to pull back a little. And what's weird is a lot of the article is not actually negative towards Felix. It talks about Felix starting a book club, how that is normally a really hard thing to get people involved in, but his videos when he's doing that still get 3.5 million views. They say on YouTube how he has bigger numbers than Justin Bieber, CNN, Nike, and Coca-Cola. They mention his past scandals, but then say outside of that, he's not really usually written about. They talk about how he has several shows, how part of it kind of emulates TV shows, how over the years he evolved from just a little baby creator who is awkward in front of the camera to someone that's incredibly comfortable and has a man beard. But then towards the end, we finally get that shift that gave us that headline. They talk about him using <gasps> Pepe the Frog, how he gave a positive review to a book from Jordan B. Peterson, how he showed memes of Neil deGrasse Tyson and Barack Obama having different names under their picture. And then finally, it ends on the note. To call him an alt-right agitator would perhaps be unfair as he has never publicly identified with the proto-fascist movement, but he shares much of their culture and amplifies it across the world. People should pay PewDiePie more attention. If near the beginning of your sentence you say it would perhaps be unfair to blank, and after the blank you include but, it appears pretty apparent that you are trying to connect those dots for your reader. Because they end the article that way, it feels like they're trying to say that the other content, it's just, it's just stuff to throw people off the scent. Like next month he's gonna try and sneak in Mein Kampf into the book club. And so the whole article to me just seems weird and scummy. I think you can definitely connect a Felix to an anti-PC movement, 100%, and I am personally on board with a lot of that. He, like the, the, the mention of Pepe the Frog. That became a fun way to mess with people who wanted to say just blanket statement, all uses of Pepe the Frog, racist. But to then try and connect dots because he likes trolling and then some people that you're trying to connect him to, they also troll and fuck with people. That connects them disregarding so much more of the real situation, that's ridiculous. Obviously, I do want to note here, I am going to be biased with this story. Petty shots like this from mainstream outlets rub me the wrong way. But that said, I do want to pass the question off to you. What are, what are your thoughts about this? Is, is this a, a petty shot because they're trying to get views? No, the person writing the article, they have a valid point. Whatever you think, I want to hear about it. And then let's talk about an internal conflict we're seeing at Google right now. Yesterday, it was reported that employees at Google began circulating an open letter demanding that Google stop working with the Department of Defense on artificial intelligence. And reportedly, that open letter has been signed by more than 3,100 Google employees. Now, dissent over the partnership actually began last month month after it was revealed in an internal memo that Google had begun working with the Pentagon's Project Maven. And Maven, if you don't know, is a push by the Pentagon to more actively use AI in the military's everyday functions. And in April of 2017, during the internal announcement of Project Maven, then Deputy Defense Secretary Bob Work said, as numerous studies have made clear, the Department of Defense must integrate artificial intelligence and machine learning more effectively across operations to maintain advantages over increasingly capable adversaries and competitors. And one of Maven's first projects was to use machine learning and AI to help scour hours of drone footage and identify objects of 
interest for the military. This because there's so much footage a human analyst just can't get through in a timely manner. And Maven tackles this issue by using Google's TensorFlow API to identify and track up to 36 different category of objects. And these known objects are reportedly things like when vehicles or people go from location to location. And so the Pentagon's hoping that this can really help humans, but of course still keeping humans in place. The head of Project Maven saying he hoped people and computers will work symbiotically to increase the ability of weapon systems to detect objects. Eventually, we hope that one analyst will be able to do twice as much work, potentially three times as much as they're doing now. That's our goal. And as far as Google's involvement with Maven, it's part of a pilot project. Also, considering we're talking about the Department of Defense here, this is relatively small in scale. Reportedly, Maven is only planning on spending 70 million in its first year. Now that said, let's jump back to the letter. After it was signed by over 3,100 people, it was sent to the CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai. And the letter starts off pretty blunt. Reading, Dear Sundar, we believe that Google should not be in the business of war. Therefore, we ask that Project Maven be canceled and that Google draft, publicize, and enforce a clear policy stating that neither Google nor its contractors will ever build warfare technology. They point out one of Google's core tenants, which is don't be evil. But also on that note, Google's parent company, Alphabet, they removed that motto back in 2015. I'm not saying that was the moment they were like, no, let's start being evil, but just random thing I wanted to share. The letter also responds to a statement from Diane Green that was meant to calm fears over the program when it was first revealed last month, saying recently Googlers voiced concerns about Maven internally. Diane Green responded, assuring them that the technology will not, quote, operate or fly drones and, quote, will not be used to launch weapons. While this eliminates a narrow set of direct applications, the technology is being built for the military, and once it's delivered, it could easily be used to assist in these tasks. And they end their letter saying, building this technology to assist the U.S. government in military surveillance and potentially lethal outcomes is not acceptable. Now, after this, the CEO of the company, Sundar Pichai, released a statement, but he just doubled down, saying that Maven was specifically scoped to be for non-offensive purposes, but he didn't reveal any text from the contract or really give anything on top of that to verify that this would be the way it worked. We also saw a Google spokesperson try to defend the company as well, pointing out that the programs being used by the military were, quote, open source recognition software available to any Google Cloud customer. Also saying that the data they scour is allegedly only unclassified data. It's used to flag images for human review, which is intended to save lives, save people time of having to do highly tedious work. But I would say on that final, final note, it really doesn't address the concerns that yes, we are building it for this one purpose, but right now it doesn't appear that there's any way to stop the military from using it in the ways that we are concerned about. But that said, even if it wasn't a contract, it, it's the government. They, they're they gonna do what they want with it. That's why it was such a big deal when back in the day when Apple said they would not unlock a phone. The whole big argument was, yes, you're saying you wanna use it in this way, but it opens up for a lot of really sketchy situations. And obviously that's a simplified version. There were more concerns, but you know, you get the idea. And let's talk about these teacher protests we've seen in Kentucky and Oklahoma. And we'll start with Kentucky where teachers are protesting due to changes to their pensions. Kentucky lawmakers had a bill that was focused on sewage, but then also included reforms to teacher pensions. And the lawmakers passed the bill, but Governor Bevin has not signed it yet. Although he did tweet support for it, saying that members of the House and Senate voted to not keep kicking the pension problem down the road, adding anyone who will receive a retirement check in the years ahead owes a deep debt of gratitude to these 71 men and women who did the right thing. Now, as far as the pension changes, reportedly that cut benefits for new teachers, but preserved them for most workers. The pension plan reportedly would phase out defined benefit pensions, replace it with a hybrid retirement plan. Long story short and oversimplified, many teachers in the state, including the union, were not happy with this, feeling like they were being left behind and screwed over. So teachers in Kentucky ended up calling out sick on Friday. On Monday, all the schools in the district were closed. That said, 75% of the schools were on spring break, but also the rest were closed to allow teachers to attend a rally. And in addition to the pension, teachers demanded more funding in the state budget for textbooks, technology, school programs. You had teachers popping on TV, explaining their stories of that they were actually having to spend their own money for things in the classroom. But also on Monday, we saw the State House and Senate pass a budget and revenue bills that included a 6.25% cut to almost every part of the state government besides education. The bill included increases in taxes like a 50% tax per pack of cigarettes, sales tax on various services, a 6% sales tax that's going to be put in place on services that were previously tax-free. Also, three tax incentives were suspended, and this reportedly increased spending for the main funding formula for K-12 schools. It also reduced individual and corporate taxes to 5%. Now, after this passed, the governor released a statement criticizing the bill, saying a fiscally responsible budget does not contain unfunded mandates and does not intentionally create budget shortfalls in the future. A fiscally responsible budget does not kick the can down the road as previous governors and legislators have repeatedly done. I am very concerned that the current proposals from the General Assembly may not meet these basic standards of fiscal responsibility. Now, that said, where we stand right now is Bevan has not signed either of the bills that have passed. Not the sewage bill that would reform teachers' pensions and not the new budget plan. And so it will be very interesting to see what he does next and how teachers react to it. And then let's talk about Oklahoma, where on Monday, around 200 of the 584 school districts in the state were disrupted by a walkout. Reportedly, more than 30,000 educators walked out, forcing class cancellations for around 500,000 of the state's 700,000 public school students. We saw many educators traveling by bus to the Capitol on Monday, where we saw people protesting inside 
inside the Capitol building. And in Oklahoma, teachers are seeking better pay and increased education funding. Many complaining that they have to work multiple jobs if they also want to be a teacher. To kind of give you an idea of how bad it is, according to a 2016 report from the National Education Association, Oklahoma teachers' pay is on average 49th in the country. The average starting salary for a teacher there is $31,919. Some districts also reportedly impose a four-day school week because they do not have the funding for five. Also, as far as things like the books they give the kids, uh, teachers have been posting pictures like this to show what they're working with. Some including history books where the current president in the book is Bush. And so the state's teacher union is demanding a $10,000 raise for teachers over three years, $5,000 raise for support staff, and $200 million in education funding. And last week, we saw the state legislature in Oklahoma vote to provide teachers with an additional raise of $6,000 per year, or 16% depending on experience. That then including $1,250 for support staff and $50 million in state education funding. Governor Mary Fallon signed that into law to pay for these raises. Politicians agreed to increase production taxes on oil and gas and institute new taxes on tobacco and motor fuel. It was a whole $450 million revenue package designed to avert this strike. And actually, according to reports, this was the first new revenue bill to become law in Oklahoma in 28 years. But still, you have the teachers sticking to their guns, demanding an additional $75 million, that seeming to be a compromise from their $200 million. And they're also holding out on their pay demands. So then let's talk about the reaction. Yesterday, Governor Mary Fallon released a statement saying, just like Oklahoma families, we are only able to do what our budget allows. Significant revenue raising measures were approved to make this pay raise and additional school funding possible. We must be responsible not to neglect other areas of need in the state, such as corrections and health and human services as we continue to consider additional education funding measures. I look forward to continuing to talk with legislative leaders and teachers as we forge a positive pathway forward for education. But on that note of not having the money in the budget, teachers criticized the House and Senate leaders for passing a measure that actually repealed a $5 a night hotel and motel tax, saying just that could have increased the package by $45 million. And so now what we're seeing in Oklahoma is that more than 100 people, including teachers and supporters, announced on Wednesday that they're going to be marching from Tulsa to Oklahoma City. Reportedly, it's a six-day march going to cover 110 miles, and they are calling it the March for Education. And so in the state, we saw districts canceling school through Friday. But there are also doubts on how much the governor is actually willing to work with teachers. This because Governor Mary Fallon said this about teachers in an interview. Teachers want more. But it's kind of like having a teenage kid that wants a better car. It's an interesting negotiating tactic to call the people who, their, their whole premise is that you don't respect what we're doing enough to actually pay us a living wage. And your response is, they're being entitled greedy children. But ultimately, like so many of the situations that are going on right now, it, it's a wait and see to who blinks first. You've got teachers who, even with the, the smaller increase, feel underappreciated, underfunded, not able to do their job properly. And then we've seen several examples of people in power who think that they are asking too much, that they are being greedy, that they're being childish but we'll have to wait and see. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications. That way you don't miss these daily weekday videos, which actually, if you did miss yesterday's show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you're in the mood for something different, you can click or tap right here to watch my episode of Hot Ones. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.